The only time I run is if I'm being chased. You reach a certain size, nobody chases you anymore. Right? Well, we, it, it's one of those things concerning the roof. I think, what, we'll be out 2 to 5% of the total cost. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? So, you know, that's how I look at it. But, you know, unfortunately, there is a falling away in the end times. Um, it's harder for, I believe, pastor's generation to understand that part of it because when you grow up in the moral majority and the golden rule and everybody goes to church on Sunday and everything's closed by 6 p.m. on Sunday night and there are dry counties and on Sunday you can't buy alcohol when you grow up in that generation it's hard to see and I'll tell you this we're not going to be coming back Jesus is That's right. right we're not coming back he is so we just have to keep that in mind, not get discouraged. But turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. <clears throat> chapter number 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 12. Funny enough, Revelation's loaded with the Old Testament. <laughs> Actually, the whole Bible testifies of itself. Amen? Revelation chapter 12, verse number 7, the Bible reads, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength, the, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath, or I'm sorry, he knoweth that he hath but a short time. <clears throat> And when the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask tonight that it would be your words and not mine, that it would be your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we'd use the scriptures, we'd rightly divide the word of truth, Lord. I ask that you would be with those who are discouraged tonight, those who are downtrodden and beaten. Lord, I, I just heard tonight of someone who lost their parents. What a sad, sad incident, Lord. And I just ask that you be with her and her husband and, and the family. So, Lord, I just I ask that uh, it would just be your words and your will in our service tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Title on my sermon, or actually, I'm going to go kind of slow. My voice, this thing, I can't get rid of it. It's like this frog in my throat that just won't go away. So I'm, <clears throat> what's that? Swallow, Swallow yeah. I, I've swallowed tons of water, Vicks, you name it, cough drops, all of it, and here it is. <clears throat> kind of sounds tough, because my other voice was kind of like Mike Tyson. Remember that guy? Right? Like you look at him and you're like, that guy, he's really tough. And then he's like, meow, meow, meow. sounds like a little mouse, right? That's, that was me, I think. I don't know. I was never that bad. All right, good. But <clears throat> this hoarse voice is kind of raspy. I feel like Mick Jagger or one of those old rock stars or something, right? Is he still alive? I don't even know. Why am I mentioning a rock star in church with a scratchy voice who smoked too much? I don't know. That's beyond, that's beyond me. But anyway, the testimony of Jesus Christ is our study tonight. 
What does it mean to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Now, I'm going to give these two definitions quickly. But testimony is something that we, we all are very familiar with. If I were to ask you, when you got saved, you would give me your testimony, your record, your account. You would testify of what Jesus did for you, right? That would be your testimony. And that's a pretty easy one to understand. But there's a lot of trouble in the word commandments because a lot of times people think commandments is your works. Or they'll think commandments, you keep the commandments of God. That means you're keeping the work of God or you're keeping the ordinance of God or you're doing all these things that really don't matter. Now, our works do matter. Our works do follow us as a Christian. As a Christian. You're not saved by works, but your works do matter. There's a reason why they do. Now, this group of people are here at this 42-month uh, period or this times, time and a half a time. And let's just find out exactly who they are and what they all have in common. So if we were to read verse number 17, we would see that the dragon is mad at the woman and he goes out to make war with the remnant of her seed. Those are people that are the remnant, a small group. And, and so many times I think that's what we mean when we say, you know, in the end times when the mark of the beast is unleashed, there's only going to be a few people that get saved. There's very few that are going to get saved. There's very few that are going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ during this time frame because there's such deception. We see it today, too, right? There's such deception. I don't know what to believe half the time. The only thing I know is this. I can't really pay attention to even news anymore. It doesn't matter which news source. You have to be able to discern and compare it with the Word of God and say, is that truth or is it error? <clears throat> A few things in this chapter that are really important. Number one is the great red dragon is cast out. Obviously, he's the old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we actually know who he is, right? We know the devil, Satan. He's cast out, and he comes down having great wrath. So if we flip the page to Revelation 13, Revelation 13, keep your place in, in, as we go through Revelation. Just put, I don't know if you have a bulletin or you're good at flipping pages. I don't know. We're going to cover a few places, but maybe tear off the corner or something and put it in there. Just make sure you pick it up when you leave, right? Revelation chapter 13, I want you to look at verse number 3 through 10. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth, speaking great things, and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So we know there's a time frame. We know the devil comes down with wrath from the last chapter because he knows he has a short time right so he's coming down woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the devil's come down to you with wrath because he knows he has a short time and when he comes down he persecutes a specific group of people in the first half of daniel's 70th week he's after a totally different group he's got a waged war on all humanity in the first part right if you look at the six uh the five, uh, five four seals in revelation six he's coming after uh, the whole world and then he shifts from the whole world to go after a group why? Because the devil already has a group that's going to worship him. He's got him. He's got him. But there's a group that opposes him he doesn't have. And that group is the ones he's going to persecute if we're following in order where we are in context. We have 12. Devil's coming down with wrath. He's going against the remnant of the seed. Those are this group of people. Verse number six. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So now we know who those people are. Who's the remnant? Those tribulation saints, right? I mean, if we were going to stay in the confines of the book of Revelation, that's what we would read. I'm going to back it up with more passages here in a moment. So here's the thing. <clears throat> Verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life from the, of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So are saints written in the book of life? Well, sure they are, right? They're the remnant 
They're the ones who have the testimony or the witness of Jesus Christ. They're the ones that are saying, hey, I overcame you by the blood. Right? We read that in Revelation 12. So this group of people is who he's going to make war with, and he's going to try to persecute and kill them. Verse number nine, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth, killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints, right? So these people have faith. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the funny thing about that. A lot of people say, yeah, but wait a minute. They keep the commandments of God. Isn't that the Israelites? Because I've heard that theory before. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So you can't serve two masters. You're only going to have one and despise the other. Let's see if this holds true. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Verse number six, and I saw another angel fly by in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now I'm going to bring up a verse in the Old Testament out of Micah chapter number five. Okay, Micah chapter number five. So we understand the definition of everlasting gospel. Okay, Micah chapter five says, Thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be littlest among the thousands of Judah, out of thee shall come a ruler whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Talking about Jesus Christ. What's that mean? He has no beginning. He has no end. The gospel is everlasting. It began with Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and it'll end at the end of the millennium, right? But wait a minute. You have eternal life. That gospel lasts forever. And our testimony in heaven and our conversation in heaven will be testifying of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So it's an everlasting gospel. The gospel's never changed. The message of faith. Here's the patience and faith of the saints of what God has done for them. Right? I mean, if we are to stay in context, if we only had one book to read. Verse number seven saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast, worship the beast, the antichrist, and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So many preach today that death or hell is separation from God. Let me point this out to you if you are in hell waiting to go to the lake of fire you might be separated from god sorta but when you go to the lake of fire you will be watched by the lamb and his holy angels to make sure that everything you did gets paid for see here's the thing my testimony is this i don't have to pay for my bad works jesus paid it all i overcame by the blood of the lamb and so did these people right Okay, so they have to pay. Matter of fact, Jesus even uses the example in the New Testament. He'll turn them over to the tormentors so that they pay in full for what they've done. And Jesus Christ is going to watch the executement of that judgment on them for all eternity because they'll pay for what they rejected. They've accepted the mark of the beast. They've accepted the false Christ. They've accepted the image and they've rejected the king of kings. And he'll make sure everything is owed for everything they ever did right? right and that makes perfect sense if you follow this in this context verse number 11 and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name now let me ask you a question can you keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ and take the mark of the beast? No. No. 
It's not that simple. Because you, if you look at verse 11, worship. That's a pretty big word, worship, right? You've worshipped the beast, his image, his mark. You have decided to put a God in front of the God of the Bible, right? And that's the difference. Okay, but there's another group. Verse number 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they. These are the saints. This is the remnant of the seed. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Pretty simple, right? But yet there are so many that get tripped up on this and they dissect the Bible in a way that they break it down and they build total chapters like that's something totally different. But if you stay in the confines of the one book, do you have any idea how many times the book of life is mentioned in the book of Revelation? Like six times. It's not mentioned throughout the whole Bible that many times. But in the book of Revelation alone, it must be an important thing for the book of life to be mentioned, right? If it's in this book six times. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. What works is that? They're good works for Jesus Christ, but not keeping the commandments for salvation, not keeping the commandments to prove that they're a Christian. They're keeping the commandments because the Holy Spirit of God won't let them do anything else. They know they can't take the mark of the beast. How many of you have ever seen the thriller from the 1970s, Don Thompson's A Thief in the Night? How many of you guys remember the time when which, and and this has really become a a movie in my own mind nowadays because I saw it with my son who needed medical attention for his wife. 24 hours it took to get in. 24 hours. And do you have a vaccine? Do you have this? Do you have that? What's your bank account information? What's all this stuff? And it's like, he's like, look, we need emergency Medicaid. I don't know what to do. And that was the right answer. But look, in Thief in the Night, guess what happens? Her baby gets sick. She goes in, and they want to see her mark. They want to see her mark. They won't treat the child. Do you remember that? Do you remember the scene? Well, okay, maybe I'm just the only weirdo. But anyway, she goes, and she says, I can't do it. I can't take the mark. Why? Because she had become a Christian during that time frame. And she knew. She had, to, she had to make sure that she put no other God before her. She had to keep the testimony of Jesus Christ, even if it cost her baby, and I don't remember if it was a boy or girl, his or her life. Right? So here's the thing. These saints are the ones that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and they keep his commandments. The works do follow, though. See, that's why it's so important. That's why so many times, I believe, pastor gets frustrated with people who aren't here on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, and maybe we come down hard, I don't know, or maybe we're beating the dead horse, or who knows. But here's the thing, it's for your good. He doesn't want you to come here so that he looks good, because there's nothing you can do that'll make him look any better. (laughs) God love him, he looks great for 88. I hope I live to at least be 78. But here... (laughs) We're talking about the oldest Mitchell living to be that age. And I'll tell you this right now. I hope, I hope the Lord doesn't return. I hope this is just a dry run or a practice run for the end times. But I have a feeling that it might not be. Right? Because this is the whole world that's going after the beast. And now we see the whole world falling apart. I mean, Russia, they just want to run into Ukraine. And they want their oil. And all the things that are going on in the world, you just look at it differently now. If it was just the United States, we'd say, look, we got to get in church. We got to go soul winning. We got to read the Bible. We got to pray. We can turn this thing around. But at this point, the fig leaves are starting to fall, and we know that winter's coming. Right? Right? And now we know the signs of the times. We know the storm clouds are rising. We know the drums of war are beating. We see famines around the world. Madagascar just got hit with a tremendous hurricane. Most people don't even know about that. Where's Madagascar? Well, if you ever played Risk, it's off the coast of Africa, and it was a hard place to hold in that game. But here's the thing. you got to know what's going on around the world, around the world around you, because here's the thing. This is unprecedented. Volcanoes are going off worldwide, earthquakes in diverse places, 
There were 60 earthquakes not too far off the coast of Oregon. Even though it wasn't the Cascade group, it was another group that has volcanic activity underwater, which can cause extreme climate change. No, it's your leaf blower. No, I'm serious. I heard Joe Biden was going to replace Tom Brady with a black woman. I mean, that's the kind of nonsense that's going on in the world. You say, I can't believe you said black woman. Well, look, I'm half black anyway. It doesn't matter. Red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Who cares? Why are we so worried about what we say? Right? Peter didn't care when he stood up at Pentecost what other people thought. He's telling them they're going to hell. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness. But whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Hey, look. King David said, if, you, if, if my soul were to be in hell, thou art there. In heaven, thou art there. Can't, no thought it was withholding from me. And he's ripping it, and he didn't care what they thought. He didn't care if, if they thought he was still some dumb fisherman or not. All he knew was the word of God, and it was like him, like in the prophet Jeremiah, like a fire. And he wanted to preach it. And he didn't care if he offended. Matter of fact, he wanted to offend because his teacher was Jesus Christ, and he offended. He didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. It's better to get cut up now than to get cut up at this time. Amen. Right? I'd rather the word of God cut me now than cut me later. <clears throat> but their works do follow them. So they're not working for their salvation. Um, turn, Look at Revelation. I'm just going to backtrack just a little. I just want to lay somewhat of a foundation on these saints. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, just so we know we're, com we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now, to this group tonight, most of this is just stuff we've gone over before. But I want you to look at verses number 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Right? So what's that mean? This world ruler comes out of the sea. Now that doesn't mean he comes out of the Atlantic Ocean. That doesn't mean he comes out of the Pacific Ocean. That doesn't mean he comes out of the Indian Ocean. That is not what the Bible says. But God puts things in a certain format in order for us to go back into the scripture to see exactly what is going on. So keep your place here and go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter number 7. Daniel chapter number 7. Now, <clears throat> God does this for a reason so that we're able to back up what we're teaching. God gives us a parallel passage. Some of the harder parallel passages are in the Old Testament. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 3, the Bible says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So there's the same similarity to this vision, right? John saw a beast come out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Those ten horns had ten crowns, and those seven heads had the name of blasphemy, right? These earthly kingdoms which Satan controls are blasphemous kingdoms because they usually put government above God. Huh, sounds familiar, right? But that's what people want. They want the government. They don't want God. With God comes morality. With God comes conviction. With God comes faith. Not being able to have what you always want every second you want it. And that's probably the hardest lesson too many Americans are learning right now. You can't just get what you want when you want it. Go get me some cream cheese, Brother John. I dare you. He can't. There isn't any. In all of Florida. Because somebody's got to make cheesecake. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, verse number four, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Now that's Nebuchadnezzar because remember his mind was taken and he was driven from among men and he was driven into the wilderness and then God put his heart back in him. There's a lesson here, seven years later. 
Okay, God deals in a lot of the same similarities so we can compare scripture with scripture. Verse number five, and behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and said, and they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. That's the Medo-Persians. Then verse number six, after this I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, the beast had also four heads and dominion was given unto it. I don't want to get into the foreheads and the wings and the ribs. I'll get into that at another time. But I want you to look at the interpretation of the dream. So if we know that this dream symbolizes the same thing that John saw. John saw a beast rise out of the sea. That beast had seven heads, right? And it had ten horns. So if we look at verse number 17 of the same chapter, verse number 17... How are we going to get the definition? Well, Gabriel explains to Daniel the dream he saw. This great be uh, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So they don't come out of the ocean. But see, here's the thing. It's funny how God puts a lot of things in the word of God like sea, and then you have to go back and really search the scriptures to see if those things be so, or rightly divide the word of truth. Here's the thing. There's so many false doctrines on the beast coming out of the sea. You'd think the beast is coming out of the English Channel. I mean, all the stuff that's going on, all the false doctrine, all the false teaching. Look, he's coming out of the earth. Why? Because he's dead. He dies. He gets a deadly wound to the head and he's healed. And then the devil gets kicked out of heaven and takes over the body. I mean, that's pretty simple, right? It should be, but man has complicated it. And there's going to be a group of people that he makes war with because Satan's always tried to kill humanity, but it's going to pick up in the first part of Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation. It's going to pick up in a way that it's never picked up before, right? We think it's bad now. Just wait. So what happens? He comes out, and now he realizes, look, God's not going to let me destroy the earth. I'm going to get into Revelation 12 with the flood and God and the earth helping the woman. That's really a neat study, but we'll do that on Sunday school. So you have to come to Sunday school to hear that one. All right? <laughs> I'll bait them into it, right? If they even, Well, some people might not care. All right. <clears throat> Here's the thing. They come out of the earth. Look at verse number 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Well, that's pretty reassuring, right? Saints of all time. But there is a group that's going to face persecution. Let's continue. Then I would know the truth of the force beast, which was diverse from all others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and one of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, let's see if this sounds familiar, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Get this. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Prevailed against them. And that's okay. I know at first glance you say, wait a minute. Why do these people not get the same promise that the other people throughout history have gotten? Well, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, hey, listen, some had the mouths of lions stopped, but others. They didn't get the promise here, but they get the promise when they get to heaven or they get the promise when they get to the millennium. So that's really important. Keep that in your mind. Verse number 22, until, so he prevails against them, the Antichrist, the beast, uh, the false prophet, the devil, they prevail against them until the ancient of days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's reassuring, isn't it? There's always something that God has for you. That's why your works do follow you. Because, see, here's the thing. If we all had the same works, we'd all have the same position in the millennium. Right? 
but we don't all produce the same works, so we don't all have the same position in the millennium. You know? And at this time in human history, it's like what I tell to my kids. Sometimes I get discouraged, but then that Marine and that competitive guy and that guy who just, you know, likes to win a fight here and there, you know, it's like what I tell my kids. I say, go work hard, do what you say you're going to do, show up when you say you're going to show up, and you'll have work because you have no competition. Same thing goes for Christianity right now. Just show up to church, just read your Bible and pray, give the gospel to some people. Guess what? You'll have a great place in the millennium. You don't have a lot of competition. Right? Unfortunately, it shouldn't be like that. If you're saved and you have the testimony of Jesus and what he's done for you, you should shout from the rooftops. But we don't. <clears throat> Scoot down to verse number 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and a times and the dividing of times. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. That's talking about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's talking about the saints from the beginning of time to the tribulation saints and their position in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's important that you keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's important that you don't put any gods before you, or I'm sorry, before him. Well, most people are putting themselves before everybody these days. But the truth of the matter is, keeping the commandments of God is going to get you a better position in the kingdom. You know, what's wrong with a little friendly competition? The Bible even says to provoke one another unto good works, right? There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. It's for your good. Do the best you can. Every day, fight to do the best you can. I'm not here to beat anybody up, take anybody down. Look, I got my own sin. I got my own problems. I'm not worried about yours and your problems. I care about you. I'll pray for you. I hope you don't have as many problems as I have. But here's the thing. Do your best every day to draw closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. So here's the thing. Do your best every day, Christian, because it does matter. Your works follow you. Amen. Just like their works will follow them. See, I think, though, many of these people during this time will get a double blessing, though, because there's going to be such a temptation to take the mark. Right? I really do. I mean, look, I'm watching Christianity today. How many Christians do you know for a little bit of food would say, well, you know, maybe I take the mark on Sunday and I get rid of it on Wednesday. Maybe I'll get it on Sunday when I got to go to Sam's and I'll get rid of it next Wednesday. I mean, Christianity's kind of like that today, right? Fair, you know, they're like those sports fans. Bengals fans are happy now. We're not fair weather fans anymore. But that's what it's like, fair weather Christians. Oh, if I just do this today, it'll be okay. If I do that tomorrow, I think. But, but your works do follow you, just like theirs. <clears throat> Turn to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation 20. You know, the end of Revelation, I'm going to try to do my best to explain the last few verses in Revelation 19 and, and some of them in Revelation 20, because it does get kind of confusing, some of it, but you got to really kind of just slow down to look at it. In Revelation 20, verse number one, this is what we see. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay, so we know who that is, the devil, Satan, the dragon. Right? Same thing from Revelation chapter number 12. Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, 
till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years amen Amen. their works do follow right so how you live does matter how they live does matter Verse number five, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, we'll go down to, um, well, let's go to... uh, I want to do something different. We got maybe, well, let's see how much time. We, we don't have enough time for that. All right. Um, I was going to do something else, but I may tie that into Sunday school. Um, no, I want to do part of it. All right, so Revelation chapter 2. I'm sorry. It just, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not very organized. You can tell by my hair. I'm starting to look like Joel Olstein. No, I sound like a frog. I think we established that before church started. <laughs> so in Revelation chapter 2, verses number 9 through 11, I just want to, put, I just want to throw these things out here because I believe it's important. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in the second death. Right? An overcomer is he who that believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. Tried 10 10 days. There's a lot of theories out on that. But the best one is if you go back to Daniel chapter 1, where you see where Daniel, uh, they do the testing for 10 days over the king's portions. That's a pretty good example and parallel passage for that study. I, I recommend you do it. Compare Revelation and Daniel, but use Revelation to explain the book of Daniel. It's so much easier that way. Um, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations right? You know what? If you do the works until the very end, God's going to bless them. He's going to give them power over the nations because they're going to rule and reign with Christ. They're going to be priests. They're going to be kings unto God and unto his Christ, right? We read it in Revelation chapter number 20. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father and I will give him the morning star. <clears throat> and we know that the morning star is Jesus Christ. Okay. <clears throat> so don't worship a false god. Turn back to Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. They keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They've not gotten caught up in false doctrine. They've not worshiped the beast. They've not worshiped his image. They've not taken his mark, right? Their names are in the book of life. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this verse troubled me for a long time, and I believe the best way to explain it, because here's the thing. If Satan comes down and takes over the beast. You know, is the beast still in that body? 
Or is it Satan who's come down with great wrath and he takes over the dead body? Because it's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment, right? So this can be somewhat confusing. But let's go back to Revelation 19. Verse number 19. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. But these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. What I believe is this. I believe that they got to skip the great white throne judgment and were cast alive into the lake of fire. And what I mean by that is this. They were grabbed hold of by Jesus Christ, the author of all living, and they were thrown alive into the lake of fire. They didn't get a chance to stand before God and plead their case. Why? Because they had deceived so many from the very beginning. And I also believe that God creates a body for someone to suffer the second death. You say, well, where would you find that anywhere in the Bible? Well, if you die absent from the bodies present with the Lord, but your body's still on the ground. If someone dies and goes to hell, where's their body? In the ground, right? So here's the thing. There's spirits in hell. Your spirit's in heaven. But when you go to the lake of fire, or you go to the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, you're in your new body, just like they're in a body built for destruction. So Jesus grabs a hold of them, and he tosses them into the lake of fire, the second death. They don't get the first resurrection like the saints throughout time. They go straight to damnation for what they've done. I think that makes the most sense of this passage because if we continue on in Revelation 20 and we go to verse number 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet, their names are not in the book of life. No. You think Jesus doesn't know that? He casts them alive for what they've done. And the devil's cast out as a spirit. And he's put in the bonds of hell, the bottomless pit. So here's the thing. The beast and the false prophet, they're burning for a thousand years. They're the only ones. Everyone else is waiting in hell for the second death. Satan's waiting to be loosed at the end of the thousand years. Right? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I think. Or does anybody have a question or does it not sound good? That's what I begin to look at when I see the Bible. Look, they're cast alive. Their bodies are alive. When you go to the lake of fire, you're burned forever and ever alive. The smoke of their torment, that's not a spiritual smoke. It's a physical smoke. Right? Forever and ever and ever and ever. It's a long time. The only thing I can't quite put my mind around is, does Satan get a body when he's cast into the lake of fire at the end? That I haven't figured out or found in the Bible. But I do believe the false prophet and the beast are cast alive, and that's their second death, and they get an extra thousand years in the lake of fire before they spend all of eternity there. Right? Because something tells me that the lake of fire is probably a little worse than hell. Not that I want to go to either one. I can't go. And if I did go, fire wouldn't even touch me because I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, if I ended up in hell, I would not, not a hair on my head would get singed. Could you say the same thing? If you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, you can. What he's done, his record, his witness, his testimony for you. <clears throat> See, verse number 12 of Revelation 20, 
Well, verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. They'll pay for everything. If you're, The difference between you and an unsaved person is, you overcame by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are covered. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. Your sins don't exist to God when you die. Your works, though, will follow you at the judgment seat of Christ and then what you get to do in the millennial reign of Christ. Your works will follow you just like their works follow them. The difference is, is they'll pay for their works. I won't pay for mine even though I deserve it. Right? Right? I deserve everything I would get from God if it were bad. I would deserve that. But thank God, Christ took my place, and I don't have to. Amen. Right? Amen. And these people have that same testimony because they overcame them by the blood. And they loved not their lives unto death. Right? If you love me, keep my commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Right? Let's turn to Revelation 14 real quick. Brother Jan preached longer last Sunday night. <laughs> oh, by five minutes you did. What's that? No, it was great. It was a great lesson out of the book of John. I was looking forward to it to, uh, tonight, but then Pastor said, I'm doing tonight, he's doing the end of the month. Now i got to wait three more weeks. He can go at the end of the month. <laughs> I have no patience of the saints. I'm terribly impatient sometimes. <clears throat> Verse number 9 and 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in, their, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You know, I think if you were to read that and you were really to think about it, how many people do you know in your family that would take that mark? That would worship that beast, that image? That's scary, right? And, how, you know, if you were to place yourself, in, you know, I, what I try to do is I try to take myself and I put myself in these different places. And I say, what would that really look like? What would it look like a world that you can't escape without making a choice? Today we get to make choices all the time, but during that time the choice is death now, right? Or death and then death again, the second death, later. And if you put yourself in that position and you think, would the people you love, would they choose to say, you know what, I'm not taking the mark, I have, want the testimony of Jesus Christ, I believe the Bible uh, or the precepts of God, I'm going to die for him. I'm not going to take your mark. People are going to laugh at them. You think there's peer pressure now to take a vaccine? Could you imagine the peer pressure? Can you imagine? Hey, well, back then it was, oh, well, here's the peer pressure. Take a drink. Here's the peer pressure. Have a smoke. Hey, here's the peer pressure. Do this. Do that. But what would you do in a time in which peer pressure determines your life or death right then? Put yourself in that shoe and then say, would my, and you fill in the blank. What would they do? And then that's the person you pray for. That's the person you read the Bible fast and do everything you can to win to Jesus Christ. Because when the ark is shut, the heart can be shut. And that's what you got to be careful of. I don't, I, you know, truthfully, there, if I were completely honest with you, there are people I do and am glad are in hell. Child molesters. No matter how hard I try. No matter how hard I try, I cannot muster up the fact of just allowing that. It's hard for me. I love my kids. Oh, I love my grandkids. 
one were to hurt him, I'd arrange the meeting as fast as I could. Is that a good thing? No, probably not. But I'm being honest with you. I struggle in a lot of areas. I get frustrated. I get angry. I get mad. I sometimes want to bring out my own wrath, right? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He'll recompense. But sometimes I want to take it and say, no, I just don't like the way it goes. I don't have the patience for that. I want that person to face the judgment. I want him to face it now. But what happens when that judgment is forever? Forever is a long time, right? You know, we all have someone, some historical figure, we're like, boy, I'm glad God judged that one. But what happens if it's someone that's in your family that's going to be judged? You know, this is the time when we need to crack open the Bible, not be afraid anymore, and share the gospel with our family, Right? And say, you know what, this is what the Bible says. And, you know, they, there's a chance they might laugh. But I've had people laugh at me before. Right? I mean, it happens. But I don't want them. What was that? What pastor said? Oh, yeah. Don't worry, I'll deal with him later. I'm not bringing the cookies I made over. You've lost out. So anyway. <clears throat> but we need to put it. Sometimes I think it'd be good if Christians just put themselves in these positions. And really thought about what the Bible's saying. And get a real kind of fear for what's going on in this book. And what could be coming in right around the corner for many people that I care about. Right? And sometimes we do well to think like that. So, all right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We, uh, we, we truly need it as a compass um, in discerning what's going on in the world. Lord, we can see the signs of the times. I always wondered as a child what it would look like. Forty years later, we're standing at the door. Lord, I just ask that... Uh, all those that we care about, those that we love. I know there's names and faces that have popped in each one of our minds. Lord, I ask that you would send strong convictions of the Holy Spirit of God that they would be saved. Lord, in eternity, in the thousand-year reign, in the new heaven, the new earth, what people think of us isn't really going to matter. But what we do for you and the people we love, if they're there, that's what matters. So, Lord, I just ask that you would send strong conviction to the hearts of those that are not saved. Each member of our church, I'm sure, has someone they know that's not saved. Lord, I ask that you would send strong conviction and that you would open a door for them to witness to that person. To at least start to plant a seed. And then maybe someone else can water it, but you get the increase. Lord, I ask that, and, it, and it's hard, Lord, I ask that we would live peaceably with all men. Lord, this is a time in human history where people's hearts are being hardened, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Even the hearts of the Christian, even my own heart sometimes waxes cold, and my flesh wants to take over, and there's a, there's a fight. Lord, uh, I just ask that you help each one of us in our areas where we falter and give in to the flesh. I want my works to follow me in a way that you give me something to do in the millennium. Lord, I just ask that you be with our church, the members who are struggling, those that are being beat up spiritually. Lord, I ask that you strengthen their hearts, strengthen their resolve, so that we can fight one last time, Lord, against the devil, his plans. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.